Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marinkoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Midwood section in Brooklyn, New York. Yes, that's fancy. Uh, Miss Brooklyn over here. <laughs> I'm going to go to Las Vegas to have <laughs> Vegas, Reno, Miami. Yeah. I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to be a dancer. I'm going to be a showgirl. Boy, oh boy, I'm going to meet the magician and get married to him. I'm going to go to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to be in the casting business and the tour business. I'm going to get to work with the legendary Arthur Cantor. I'm going to produce shows called like Bull Just and other ones with Ann Mira. Who knew? Okay, who knew? Who knew? And I have the president of the Actors Temple, the producer of the 101st anniversary show on Al Jolson. The best part of the it. The best part of it. Yes. The legendary Carol Ostra. <laughs> Already? Already. Okay. So t tell me about mom and dad because there was the, the family on the silver side you know who yes. ended up in east new york yes. and then the other side of the family so tell me about i think mom's side first oh my mother's side very cultured from austria and of course they had to leave because conditions were so bad for the jews so they came here like all immigrants and they ended life. up also in brooklyn yeah they okay did. where in brooklyn did they in Atlantic Avenue and Pacific Street. Okay, which now is very chic. Though. Very chic, okay, I must so, say. So that was, yeah. that was on mom's side. Tell me about on dad's side. On dad's side, my grandmother was a Levine, and her husband was a Feinberg. And you, you may wonder how I never was a Feinberg or a Levine, because my father did change our name early on, when my brother was born. Right. But they were, they were here from Minsk, Belarus, and they owned a silver factory and were very wealthy and, and also... And, and they, they, the silver factory was in East New York, you said, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. And then they lost it. Things went... Okay, and Dad, you told me, was... People wouldn't remember, but he, he, was, a, the, he was like the franchisee or the head of he the needs. He was, of, yes. He had a wonderful personality, and people just loved yeah, him. That picture of your dad, you know, that mustache and yes. everything. Yes, 
Yeah. So dad ran the Needix originally. As a 17-year-old boy, because the family was in dire straits, he had, I mean, there were nine in the family. He was the baby with the best personality, and he got a really good job before his brothers and the sisters, of course, got married. And, and he became the manager of Needix in Coney Island. Right, the big store. The big okay. one. And then later on, he got involved with some luncheonettes. Well, he wanted his own business. Right. And he but the luncheonettes were important because later on, when you were a kid, that's how you learned how to make change, okay? Oh, you learned mathematics. I, I learned to be behind the counter. My goodness, I learned how to serve food. My father was a better cook than my mother. Now, but did he also own restaurants later on? In yes, life? he did. He owned we, them later on. What kind of restaurants? They were in various places. I remember one was on 23rd Street and 7th Avenue years ago. I would take the train and get off on 23rd Street and visit my daddy while I was in school. And everybody loved him. Everybody came in to be around him. But, you know, reading inf information, your mother was a uh, hoot also. Oh, my mother mom, was mom. fabulous, a dancer and wanted to be a dancer her entire life. So she permeated that to her daughter Oh, later and on. she was a far better dancer than I could ever have been. So, so how'd mom, who came from the Austrian, meet the Minsk people? How'd she meet your father? Kids meet, they meet, and-, no, and you, no story on that? No really oh, okay. big story. They met, I, they I were it at could a have dance. Been a, it could have been a Coney Island story. It could have been some type <laughs> no, of- No, not that. So, but, so you, Nevertheless, they had a wonderful life, right. and mother worked with my father. That was very unusual. My mother worked right beside my father. Okay, and you were born first or your brothers? No, my brother. Okay, so mm -hmm. your brother's born first, okay? Mm -hmm. And at that time, were they living on 13th Avenue and 79th Street? That's right. Okay, right across the street from the Tora Gressa funeral home. <laughs> Well, Petey Torregrossa Peter Torregrossa was my best friend. Okay, and <laughs> they, they had, you know, they, they took care of the community and the relatives. So yeah, they that, did. So when did mom and you get involved in, because we have the picture of you of Miss Brooklyn at, at five, five years. How'd that happen? I mean, well, because mom mother, wanted to push you? Mother wanted me to realize her dreams. And later on in life, I couldn't figure out what my mother's dreams were, what my dreams were, and who was I? But I found out that I loved show business, and she is the one who pushed me. She was a show business mother, putting me in beauty contests, and if I lost, how come you lost? You must not be thin enough. And so I wanted to please my mother until I was about 17. Okay, so you moved from Torregressa, 13th yes. Avenue, to the Midwood section yes. of Brooklyn, where you now are on Ocean Avenue, Ocean Avenue. Uh, between R and S. Yes. And now you're at Midwood High School, at Madison, Madison. James Madison mm -hmm. High School. And at James Madison, you were involved with the theater, I assume. Oh my goodness, I wrote, I directed, I starred in, won the medal, I want you to know, right, best but you, actress. But, but you also said when you lost, it really hurt you that you were number two, or was it mom pushing on that? No, I felt like a complete failure if I wasn't number one. That pressure that I put on myself. So, so what happens at 17 with JJ over there? Well, well, what happened was that I auditioned. It was the summer vacation. I was working. I wanted my own money. Where were you working? I was working in the Empire State Building for a sweater company. And Boy, that's interesting. Sweaters later on. Later on. Thing. Who knew? So I... I was auditioning. I always had the papers, the actors, newspapers, who was auditioning, what was going on. I'm taking acting lessons, going to business school to learn how to type, which my mother told me never do, but I knew I had to. Right. So I do that and I find an ad for an actress in a film. During lunch hour, I take my time off, I go to the building, a little terrible building with a big, big, enormous elevator. I walk into this elevator and in walks this man, really tall with a beard and long hair and a Texas accent and he says, who are you, honey? And I said, my name is Carol Hannon. And he said, I'm gonna make a star out of you. And that's when I decided, not knowing him, stupid, I decided that's it. This man is my destiny. He's going to make me into a star. Now, this guy was a Jewish magician? 
Yeah. J, what was his name? J. J.G. Tiger. The G was for Goldman. <laughs> And was he from Texas? Texas. Oh, he was yeah. really from Texas. Yeah. So what happens is your mother, as we were joking, which I will say on here, finds out that her daughter is moving to Las Vegas with... No, not... No, she doesn't know from Las Vegas, and neither do I. I'm going to go on the road as the magician's assistant. So you and went on the... that's what I did. So you went on the road, and when... Then you got married to J.J.? Yes. Okay. I couldn't leave home without being married. Mom, we know sat shit for you. Oh, okay. she, I was dead to her okay. eye. Gone. Later, thank God later forgotten. on the world changed, okay? Well, it changed because I was in Las Vegas and I had a part on that stage. My mother comes and sees me and she says, you see that girl over there? So That's now my daughter. <laughs> okay, so, so you're on stage uh, as a dancer? Yeah. Okay. Whatever I could, because I'm very tall. Very often the dancers were all short, so if they wanted me to be a showgirl, I was a showgirl. Whatever they needed so I could did, stay in did show you have, business. Did you have the... Oh, yes. What time is it? Showtime! <laughs> so, so from Vegas, JJ, that didn't last long, but you no. did some... You, you took some courses at University of Nevada. I did. And then you get, ended up in Reno. I did, because I auditioned for another show. I'd already gotten rid of Tiger, poor thing, and fell in love with the orchestra leader who was going up to Harris in, in Reno and said audition with, with Barry Ashton, who was putting on Les Femmes de Paris. So I did, and I got a showgirl part so and moved show to Reno. So from Reno, how do you end up in Miami? I mean, well, we have pictures of you in Miami, okay. Yes, I was with the orchestra leader at this time, and I, I didn't like the atmosphere. It was the biggest little city in the world. There's a big sign across the main street, and it was, but there was an element there was that the, wasn't Was it Arthur Godfrey Boulevard at that time? Arthur Godfrey Boulevard, right. all of that. And I just decided I needed to be an actress again, not this showgirl, because there wasn't very much respect. And we weren't treated very well. Okay, so... You, I was a Jewish princess. I didn't like that. Right, but later <laughs> on, you, you, you even produced a show called The Jewish Princess, right? I certainly did. Okay, which we'll get to in yes, a while. Yes, I did. So, so you're in Miami. So I decide, no, I didn't get there yet. I went to Barry and said, Barry, I'd like to learn to be a choreographer. But I'm, I, I think it's much easier. I mean, I would pull my back muscles right. and... oh. Terrible. I said, it's not for me. I'd like to choreograph like you do. And he was a wonderful man. May he rest in peace. And uh, he said, you want that? I'll help you. So I would shadow him. And he gave me the choice of going either to Miami or Japan. In Japan, they liked redheads. But I thought, that's a little too far away from my mother. I think I'll stay here and go to Miami, which I did. OK, so you're in Miami. And you're acting and you're modeling. How do you end up in Washington, D.C., the next stop? Well, I'm in the big show. And I'm having the time of my life. And what's the big show? Oh, the big, they had two rooms. They had a small bar room where they had... In Miami. Um, in Miami. In at which the, hotel was Well, it? it was the Americana Hotel oh. that had just changed into the Sheraton. So they had a smaller showroom, a bar room where they had singers and the orchestra and a comedian but then in the big show room they had the big show i was in the big show and you had the big rollers in the big show i did i played the madam <laughs> okay and, 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 and in between shows i'm studying and i'm earning a little extra money babysitting many of the girls right, and children. then you went to school there also i went to school there too right. and i'm studying and one of the show girls comes downstairs from sitting in the bar room and says two bachelors from washington dc they pointed to you they wanted to meet you especially the one who is already divorced another one is going through a divorce okay so i said so that was mr ostro i sit down next to him there's this big table one seat i sit down Hello, my name is Carol. He says, hi, my name is Alvin Ostro. And two weeks later, I am Mrs. Alvin Ostro. And now you move to Washington. Washington, D.C. So in Washington, you're continuing your career. Well, there was not much to do in Washington at the time unless you were politically affiliated, and I wasn't. So I started teaching exercise classes, and then someone said, you're thin enough, why don't you model? And I thought, good idea. I go to a modeling agency. 
I'm modeling. And I find that the shows are so dull. You've seen these shows where all the models are, are looking like human hangers and they're angry. And I thought, this is not right. So I went to the head of Saks Fifth Avenue, forget her name at the moment, and I said, listen, you don't have to pay me, but I'd like to make cheerful choreography shows, and I'd like to choreograph a show for you. I think fashion it's shows better. at Saks and then other you said And other. then Garfinkel's and Hoshel Cohn in Baltimore and also every every Claire Dratch which was a bridal shop I put on all of their bridal shows. I was in them as well as choreographing them and I decided then Staying skinny as a model was also not for me because I developed anorexic and bulimia. Both a double right. whammy, just to be thin. So, so you, you so I bought up, the agency so I worked you for. You bought the agency, and it was mm -hmm. you and two other women. Yes, Carol Ness and Dagmar Whitmer, and Carol Ostro. And this was an agency called Central Casting. Right. So. And I also started because someone came to me and said, "Do you do tours?" I said, "Sure." And I thought, how am I going to do a tour? So you did tours of Washington? Yes, other? called okay. Central Tours. So you had the agency yes. modeling, okay, yes. and you had the tour business, and yes. then you were involved with the Toastmaster organization? That's right. I was president of uh, the, the Toastmaster, Toastmaster <laughs> organization. <laughs> My God, you did your homework. So all the time, Mom is still here. Yes. Okay. Dad had, hadn't it passed. He's gone. Okay, he's yeah. gone. Okay. But you hadn't come back to the Apple. What brought you back to the Apple, or New York City, as we well, would Well, I'm still an actress, even though I'm doing all of these peripheral things. I thought, it's not good enough. I right. need to do my acting, because I was hungry to express myself, whatever that meant. So I took the train on Saturdays and came to New York to take lessons with the best, which was HB Studios, Herbert Burghoff, and his wife, Uta Hagen. So, Herbert was wonderful and very complimentary. And I thought, well, now it's time to be with Uta Hagen. Well, Uta Hagen was one tough customer. I didn't do anything right, according to her. But I learned. I really learned the craft, and to, to, which was good for me to lose myself into a character, to completely become that character. And it was great fun, did some acting. And then while I was doing that, I was invited to a party on Thanksgiving. But I still lived in Washington, D.C. So I took the train, I go to a party, and I'm in the elevator, and I meet this wonderful man. A.K.A. Yorker, the Sweater. The Sweater King. And tell me about that. Well, who knew? He was a recent widower. He, his wife, whom he had been married to for 40 years, had just passed. 39, it said on the... Uh, oh, did it say? No, we'll round it off to 40. Right. <laughs> but he was married. Right. And widowers are wonderful because even if they had a terrible marriage, they stick with it. Right. What was his first name? Jean. Jean. Mm -hmm. Jean was a, uh, a World War II vet. Uh, a hero. A hero. Yes. Three-star, silver star, a Wharton graduate. Uh, Brilliant. And, and he really ran a very company, great company called Beldock Popper. That's right. Uh, which was so it was called Beldock Bel Industries. Beldock. Beldock Popper was only one of the divisions. Right, but Beldock Industries. Mm -hmm. And you and Jean get married yes. at the Pierre Hotel. <laughs> okay. But now, how do you get into producing? Well, my husband was so great that if, if I went ahead and auditioned and it was summer stock, I would say, Jean, there's summer stock. I'd like to go. And he said, sure, sweetheart, if it makes you happy. And here the sky end of industry, the sweater king, would drive up and he would give out the programs while his wife was acting. I mean, that, that, was, that was quite a man. And so Jean got very ill very quickly. We had two fabulous years before we got married, two incredible years while we were married, and then he had his heart attack, and for the next 18 years, he got sicker and sicker and sicker. So I had to be very careful. He also had five sons, right? and they were watching me very carefully. And I knew that uh, acting was fine, but I needed 
to perhaps get something a little more stable. So how do you meet the legendary author Cantor? That's really interesting. I thought if, if I really want to continue, I was going to give it this last burst of energy, then I need to buy a show, option, a, a, a beautiful script, and I'll put myself in it. But I needed to hear the script from the page to the stage is a whole different matter. So I cast the, the, the script with all of the people that I worked with at HB Studios. They were my mates, my schoolmates. Right. And the teacher of the class, the drama teacher, was the director. And I got the theater, I got everybody cast, I ordered food. Before I knew it, I became the producer. So we put the show on for my friends, and they were all very sweet. They but didn't it was tell a you terrible the terrible show. Terrible. They didn't tell me the truth. They didn't want to hurt my feelings. It was horrible. It was a comedy that turned out to be a charity. So the playwright, who was still a very good friend of mine, Margie Oberlander, said, listen, there's a very big producer. You probably know him. He's interested in this play. He'll get the money and put it on. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I call him up. Mr. Cantor, my name is Carol Ostro. And he said, wait a minute. Was that your, and he used the Jewish expression, was that your Fakakta show I saw last night? And he said, don't put any money into it, but if you really want to learn how to be a producer, you come to my office. Well, my feet never touched the ground. I hung up the phone, changed my clothes, and went to his office. And you and spent, what, like 10 years with Arthur? Six years with Arthur as his slave in the beginning. Right. But you, you and Arthur put some shows together, some we really did. good ones. I uh, became his partner. Right. Bold Jest was one Bold of the... Jest, A right. Room of One's Own with right. Eileen Atkins. Then you did the one with uh, Anne Frank. Uh, Anne Frank, uh, that's with right. Andy, uh, with oh, no, Martha. the Anne Frank was ADL. I did that on my own when I got involved. But before that, you Before did... that, we did I Do, I Do, and all at the Lambs Theater. Wonderful. And yeah. then we produced Bo Jest all over the country. Right. Well, it was time for me, I thought, to move on from Arthur. And I didn't say that to him because I wasn't sure about the move myself. But I was called by a group of producers who needed the last bit of money. They needed, I guess, about $50,000 for a show that was being done at the Manhattan Theater Club, written by Ann Mira, her first attempt at playwriting. Well, I thought, Ann Mira, I've got to go see it. So I bring Arthur with me, and we go, and there is Anne Mira, the famous, wonderful woman, standing at the door, greeting everybody, handing out the playbills. She greeted me. She didn't know me, but she knew Arthur and paid respects to him. And there was Jerry Stiller, the one who was on television. And I was very impressed with her, because having worked so many years with Arthur, playwrights can be difficult. They don't want to change anything. They want it the way it is, and that's not necessarily a healthy way for a producer to have a relationship with a playwright. Things change. So I saw how cooperative she was, and I said to Arthur afterwards, Arthur, I would like to produce this. And he said, I don't think you should. He said he didn't like it. And, and asked him why. I mean, he's the, the, the king of producing. And he gave me reasons. And I thought, you know what? It's time I left Daddy and went on my own. And that's what I did with Anne Mira in Afterplay. Let's talk about Andrea Marko Markovici. Oh, yes. And also, let's talk about how you got in the group sales business. Oh, well, that I did with Arthur Cantor when we did Bo Jest. It was a Jewish show. And I was always worried about filling the theater. We had no trouble filling the theater with a number of other shows, but I worried about this one. And I started calling. While Arthur and I were in the same room together, he was doing his thing, I started calling friends of mine that I knew were involved with Jewish organizations, with DASA, with, with a Jewish National Fund. And I said, listen, I'm involved with a show. I'll be very happy to come to a luncheon that you have. I'll talk about the show, and maybe we can get a small group together, and I'll give you a discount. And that's how I started. So you've been in the group sales business for how many years? At least 20? 20 years. So it's, it's continued on. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the shows that we were just talking about. Uh, 
The ADL production. The ADL production at Town Hall. I did that. I got involved with an, a number of other shows that I, that I did for organizations, but I also got involved in a musical called Inside Out, and that was with the Frankels, a beautiful little musical that starred Jan Maxwell, who has passed away, but she was beginning her career, and it was a wonderful show. What about the 100th anniversary for ADL? ADL asked me to do something very special for their 100th anniversary and that was in 2013. And I thought, this really has to be special. ADL is such a wonderful organization for the Jewish people as well as for bigotry and, and uh, any of the things that we find so horrible in our society today. And I, I'm really gonna work hard. So I called Ted Sperling, who is a, a phenomenal musical director, had the Tony for, for South Pacific, and for Light in the Piazza, I called him and said, would you help me with this? He said, yes. I called Richard Tolins, who had written a number of Broadway shows. And I said, we need to put together something special about the history of Broadway in tandem with the growth of ADL. Let, let's talk about the Actors Temple and your involvement and the productions that you've been doing with them. It was a very sad time of my life. I wanted to say Yiska for my husband. My parents were gone, and I felt very lonesome. So a friend of mine in show business said, come to the Actors Temple. You'll feel right at home. I walked in. I, of course, had to go to the ladies' room, and I saw on the stairwell all of these old-time Jewish actors who were members and who raised money. And I absolutely fell in love with this little, as I call, jewel of a shul, went on the board, and then at this moment, I'm the president. You're the president of the Actors Temple. Yes. Now, the Actors Very Temple proud. just celebrated its 101st anniversary. But yes. in reality, that was when the service was started. The synagogue wasn't built till 1923. That's right. It was the West you, Side Hebrew Arts Association. Right, and you, you've been doing a lot of renovation and major work over there. Every time we make a nickel, I put it into the building. Let's talk last and most important about your daughter. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I got a phone call from a friend who was a volunteer at Covenant House. And she said that her brother had also been volunteering on that day and there was a very beautiful girl who didn't speak English at all, who seemed to be in a lot of trouble and didn't belong there. And would I join them in helping her in life in this country? She was a recent immigrant from the Coast Ivoire, the Ivory Coast of Africa spoke no English, was all alone in the world. And I didn't know her or anything about her except what they said, and I said, yes, I will join you. And so there are three families that help Sammy, and they have children of their own, they have lives of their own. So I took over. So, you know, I think yeah. it was good that mom pushed Miss Brooklyn into the <laughs> theatrical business, and I think that the city is lucky to have you, the oh. Actors Temple. And thanks for being here today. Thank you. Very nice of you to have me. My pleasure.